My name is Alex Caserta. I recently retired from a 34-year career as a visual arts instructor in order to embark on a new adventure. As a photographer, my goal is to reveal historical information while shedding new light on the people and places that sustain our rich cultural heritage. This is an opportunity for us to discover the farms, food, and flavors of our beautiful state. This is a time for us to explore the diverse wonders in our own backyard. This is Harvesting Rhode Island. I'm here with Don Jocelyn today. We are down in Hopkinton, and Don is the president of the Rhode Island Beekeepers Association. Don, how many hives do we have down here? Um, at my current property, I have 20 hives. Um, some are in different stages. I have hives that are three years old, hives that are two-year-old, and hives that are one-year-old. How many years will a hive actually last? Um, as long as you keep a fresh queen in and go three to five years with a hive. You actually teach a class. Myself, I teach at URI. Um, there is uh, Betty Minucci for the Rhode Island Bee Association that teaches at Rick, uh, Rhode Island College. And also at URI is Steve Burke. He also teaches classes. Now, if somebody wanted to actually uh, begin uh, with their own hives, uh, where would you go and buy the kits? I would suggest anyone that wants to start beekeeping, take the class first. Um, once you get the class under your belt, the instructors will tell you where to purchase bees. There's all sorts of companies out there. There's local ones in Rhode Island. Usually most of them come from either Georgia or California. Um, there's other states out there that produce bees, but they're the biggest ones. There seems to be a, a big surge in interest in uh, beekeeping uh, recently within the past few years. Incredible. Everybody wants to try beekeeping. Um, there's been a lot on the news about colony collapse disorder. Don, what can the average person do to help bees? Um, one of the biggest things people can do is plant flowers that produce nectar and pollen. Um, for the bees to consume, which there is lists of pollinators. You can go online and find them. Flowers, I know one that we have that is beneficial to the um, bees is uh, butterfly bush. They enjoy it in, oh, yeah. in um, September and October. It blooms and it's one of the few things besides goldenrod that's out that time of year. And the bees pack it away for their winter stores. Do they stay with one particular hive, or will they jump from one hive to another hive? Okay, you have three bees in a hive. You have a queen, there's only one. You have worker bees, there's thousands of them. And you have drones. Drones are the male bee. Now, the drones in the hives, they'll drift from hive to hive. The rest of the bees have their own hive, they'll stay there. They will not, they'll, when they go out to get nectar, they'll bring it back, or pollen, they'll bring it back to their hive. They usually will not drift. If they drift, they'll get killed. There's god bees in front. Each bee gives off a different smell, and they'll know it's from a different hive, and they'll kill it. Or they'll fight it till it leaves and goes to its own hive. Well, you, you say a different smell. Um, do humans give a smell off that the bees detect? Yes, um, almost every animal gives off a fear pheromone. Um, you don't smell it, but if you were a lion or a tiger, they can smell it with their tongue. Well, insects can pick up on it too. So if you are deathly afraid of bees, they're gonna know that. Um, they will fly to you to sting you. You purse pry more, but it's something your body, you can't control. You're going to give it off. Okay. And the bees will pick up on it. Any safety tips in terms of bees? Move slow. And uh, the last thing a honeybee wants to do is sting you because it's the last thing a honeybee will do. When they, they sting you, they die. They die. Um, and if you've got a hive and you're afraid to go in it, if you pick the right time of day, the bees don't mind. They're busy as a bee. Um, you could go through a hive without ever getting stung. 
a hive, if you're going at the wrong time, the bees will try to protect the hive. So, and never ever stand in front of a hive. Because that's where the bees are coming and going. If you block them, you're going to get stung. You always stand behind the hive. So the, the actual production or collection of honey occurs how many times in a season? Actually, I'll take my honey all summer long if the, the frames are completed. Um, okay. They have to be completed. The bees cap the honey. When it's capped, you can take it. Before that, it could ferment because it's not dry enough. And you can actually open up the top of the box and see at what stage the production is actually in. I will show you that, yes. Okay. It's, it's a very neat thing to see. Um, the bees, they actually consume the nectar in their body. They produce honey. They spit it back into the cell. Um, if you look at it and it's shiny, that means it's way too much water in it. So the bees still have to dry it. When it gets a haze on the outside of it, it's just before the bees will cap it with wax and it's done. Alright Alex, this is inside of a hive. I always tend to stack my gear behind me um, as I go through a hive. This is the pollen patty. I like to feed my bees pollen so if it rains for three or four days, they don't have to consume all the pollen they bring in. So I give them artificial pollen, well pollen that was taken from a hive out west. These are honeybees. This is a honey super that just went on 10 days ago. There's not a lot of bees in that because they have, it's all drawn out, drawn out wax. I'll show you what it looks like. I reuse the supers every year after I've taken the honey out of them. This is beeswax. Um, they haven't started putting honey in it yet. They're just starting to clean it up, the bees, because it hasn't been on long. But it's, it's wax drawn out. The bees will put the honey in it. Now they create the beeswax. Bees, as they're a nurse bee, makes wax. Their whole body will, from different segments in their body, secrete wax and they make wax and they build it into wax, um, into honeycomb. Once the honeycomb is put in place, then they'll actually fill it with the uh, pollen and... I'll sh we'll see that in a minute here. This is called a queen excluder. So my queen doesn't get into my honey. This is my honey. Any boxes on top is my honey. And I don't want the queen to lay eggs in it because when I extract it, I'll extract baby bees instead of honey. Okay. So. So I don't want my queen to, to go in the top. Okay, let's see the temperament of my bees today. It's a nice day. They should be nice. Take out a couple of the outside frames. Okay. This is... As you notice, I told you before, um, if it's shiny, not quite honey yet. Yep. The bees have spit it in. This is shiny, it's reflective, it's honey, but it has not been dried by the bees. Um, when it gets consumable, it'll be hazed over. Um, the humidity inside of the the honey will be around 18, 17 and a half to 18 percent, um, which means it will last up to 2,000 years. <laughs> now, those are workers we're looking at? Yes, it is is workers. Worker bees. They're actually spitting honey. The bees glue everything together with propolis. 
This is very, very shiny, as you would like to see. It's yeah. it's new honey. Got a shiny. This is honey that has already been capped. Oh, okay. You can see the difference. Yep. This is capped honey. And you have a hood on, Alex, but usually... Oh, that's incredible. A bees will go through and cap that right back over. Fresh honey. <clears throat> now, this is more honey. Yeah, that's quite full. Yep. Now, you would think honey doesn't weigh a lot. Hold that, Alex. It's quite heavy. It weighs about seven to eight pounds, okay. one frame. There's a lot of honey in here. Don, how many bees do you think we have here? Um, this hive only has about 40,000 by the looks. And right right in front of us? Uh, right in front of us, there's only about around, around a thousand bees on this frame. They're all doing the same thing. They're spitting honey into the cells. As you notice, see how they started capping on top? Yep, yep. That's where they first started spitting in probably the beginning of the week. Um, they work their way down. Yes, they will work their way down. All right, I don't see any brood. I'm going into the bottom box now. I'm looking for the brood. Make sure I have a good queen here. If not, I would replace her. It's all part of hive management. Now, a lot of people are under the impression the smoke puts the bees to sleep. It does not. The smoke just blocks them from giving off the pheromone that says, sting me. Because if one stings you, it tags you, and all the rest will try to follow it and sting you also. So the smoke stops them from giving off the pheromone that says, sting me, sting me. This box weighs about 45 pounds. That's much darker. This is pollen. Yeah, it's just an older frame. But see the different colors? That's all yeah. pollen in there. This is the outside once the bees tend to rob some of the wax and use it elsewhere. So once in a while you'll get holes in your outside frames. But that's why I wanted to check it. Oh, okay. There's a queen here and she is laying out. Oh, okay. Let's see if we can get the sun behind us over here. And if you look in there, they're all baby brood just starting to to hatch so I should be able to find a queen now she'll be larger than the other yes bees. she will and here's my queen right there is my queen oh yeah this is the queen Alex she runs the roost she's a carnolan queen she's darker than an Italian but she's looking to lay eggs right now so I don't like to hold her out too long, so I'm yep. gonna put her back in the hive. She runs the hive. If you're living next door to someone who keeps bees uh, and they have children, is there any type of risk? Not that bad. Um, but if I lived next door and I had four or five kids in my household, first thing I would do while the, the child is young is I, I would get an EpiPen and I would let them get stung. Get your, child stung at least once so you know for sure that there is an allergic reaction. Don, have you ever been stung by a bee? Oh, <laughs> I get stung every day, Alex. So the most I've got stung is over 200 times. I get stung, I dropped the box last year for the first time. Different people react differently to stings. Um, you have people that are allergic and then you have people like me that's like getting bit by a mosquito. Most people, out of all people, They'll get stung, they'll have a bump, they'll swell up, and they'll itch for five days. Honeybees will make you itch. Um, 
it's usually for five days. I don't get that. Okay, thank you. We're here at Wicked Tulips today in Johnston, Rhode Island, and I'm here with Kerry Ann and Yuran Koman from all over the place, really. Yeah. I mean, started off in Holland, and you ended up on the West Coast, and then you went to Virginia, and now you're in Little Rhodey, yeah. which is terrific. Um, you have how many acres here in this farm? Well, we are leasing, we're leasing about five acres. Uh -huh. Uh, we're hoping to go up to 10, but we lease this from the state. Um, so there are, do you know how many acres total on this farm? I think like uh, there's 60 acres on the farm. Yeah, so we're one of several farmers that are, are leasing the land over here, which has been a, a blessing for us. And we have right now two and a half acres in production. When we were searching for land and we came across this, we were, we were ecstatic. Mm -hmm. And then when we came out to see it and saw how beautiful it was out here, it just uh, got better and better. Now, Euron, why don't you give us a little bit of background on how you got started? You come from a third generation uh, farming industry in Holland. Yes, I uh, grew up in Holland on a tulip farm and my family has a 150 acre tulip farm. It's a medium sized uh, company and uh, there, are, uh, there are, as you know, uh, uh, in Holland many, many, many tulips. Uh, in total, I think 20,000 uh, acres of tulips. And uh, 10 years ago, I uh, had a job offer in the Washington state. And so I moved uh, over there to become the grower of a big farm out west in Washington state. And, and then I came to uh, Virginia in 2008 and met Carrie Ann. Yeah. And we started uh, soon after our own business. And if you went, when you went to school, when you went to college, you studied uh, business engineering? <laughs> yes, or? indeed. Like I am the... <laughs> Uh, I'm the little brother of a family of uh, four boys, so my, my three older brothers, when I was young and working in my school vacations on the farm, I think always uh, were able to do the fun the fun farm jobs, uh, driving the tractor, etc. And and I always felt like the little boy, the little uh, the little one who, uh, who needed to do the, the less cool jobs. And so when I was a teenager, uh, farming was for me not uh, the ideal uh, way of living <laughs> and I decided to study something completely different but then I was uh, done with my study uh, and I uh, realized that working for big oil companies or something is not really my uh, my passion and uh, I'm very glad I uh, pursued my uh, my dreams again and uh, and uh, went into farming. And Carrie Ann, you uh, studied Nothing to do with farming. All or sorts of things, right? You were in uh, yeah. uh, counseling for a while. You were going to do um, I was gonna be cardiac a... therapy. Yep, cardiac rehab therapy. Um, I went to VCU and, you know, when I was done, I was waitressing. I was working. And then I became a mortgage broker More. for a time. And that didn't go well, as all of us know. And uh, so when Yeroon and I met, um, I was ready to transition. I had no idea I was going to be transitioning into farming or even just an online tulip um, business. So, but I was very happy. It was a big change, but one that I was very, very happy to take on. Now you started the business in Rhode Island selling bulbs uh, yeah. across the country. I, yeah, our business is, is uh, uh, split in two ways. We are uh, doing the UPIC, but it's a uh, tourism uh, yep. business. And we uh, sell bulbs online on ecotulips.com. And we are the only certified organic flower bulb uh, business in the US. And we uh, as we started that already in 2009. In, in Virginia. In Virginia. In Virginia. And we, uh, we moved up uh, last fall uh, to uh, to start growing our our own bulbs because in Virginia it is uh, not the right climate to grow bulbs. It's way too warm in the spring. Now, Carrie Ann, you've got some incredible selections here. Yeah. For uh, the types of tulips that you have available, you you're not going to go into a grocery store and buy anything like this. They just don't have them. They don't. We wanted to really show people how exciting tulips could be, and so having the doubles, the parrots, um, variegated leaves, um, just amazing colors, and I think that's why people have been 
turned into tulip maniacs here yeah. <laughs> because they were coming out with arm loads and they were, we'd hear people exclaim like, I didn't even know that's a tulip. Is that really a tulip? It's not a rose, it's not a peony. What is that? Um, so it's created a lot of excitement and, um, and it's also inspired people, which is what we want to do to inspire people to garden and to do something like this in a, probably a smaller version uh -huh. at their own home. So they've I mean, been very excited. This is a great experience. Now when you're picking a tulip fresh like this out of the ground, I'm assuming it's going to last a little longer also. Definitely. And if it's just starting to open, you can, I've had my tulips last for about two weeks, but we always say about a week, but it's usually 10 days, 14 days, um, sometimes longer. Now, uh, I'm assuming once the business continues to be successful as it is now, that you'll probably look for land someday where you can have your own land and maybe more acreage to... Maybe, maybe. but the, the nice thing also of meeting uh, Carrie and like my background is a massive uh, uh, large-scale farming and I always uh, have been taught of uh, um, yeah, having your uh, growing your successful business and start to invest to, uh, so you can grow your, your business bigger. And uh, Karen taught me that it's not only important to uh, to grow bigger and make more money, but also to grow a happy life. And yes. so yeah. when we make <laughs> when we are able to to make a sustainable financially business with two and a half acres, or maybe we go to five acres, but, uh, and, and we can uh, manage that. And uh, when we uh, organize our, our event, we can walk around with smiles on our faces and we, if we see the smiles of the people faces, then we have our, accomplished our dream. And when we make this 10 times bigger with 10 times more uh, visitors, I think it's going to be a more lot work. more stress uh, more on our stress, shoulders. More stress, more work, yeah, more headaches. <laughs> uh, earlier you were telling me how the, uh, the tulip bulb in Holland was worth more than gold at one point. <laughs> <laughs> yes, indeed, we had the, the, the tulip mania. It was just that uh, the, the tulips, they became very popular for the rich. The demand was uh, very high and the supply was low. And uh, the, the rich people really wanted to have these bulbs. And the, the fun uh, and, and, and interesting part is that it became an, an, uh, a form of, of trade that um, that even even the the, the regular uh, the regular people were uh, uh, starting to invest in this uh, in, in the tulip bulbs and selling them to the to the rich, and uh, so eventually the, the the prices of the bulbs went skyrocketing high, and uh, the, the yeah one time one bulb were, was sold for an, uh, an house in Amsterdam. It's an amazing story. So they actually traded a house for a bulb? Yeah. Yes. So a, That's incredible. It would be like four ox, ten chickens, four <laughs> pigs. It, it was amazing when you would add it up. What it is is the beauty of the tulip. I mean, if you look at these ones behind us or to the right, they're, they're just amazing. And especially in New England, I think it creates a little tulip mania here because you have those long, cold winters. And then this is like the first really bright spot that comes up. It's like a herald of spring. The varieties are amazing. And when you have something that's not just like a plain color, that's like has flames of red and yellows and greens, it just brings up this natural excitement in people. Yeah, the tulips are we, very bright, vibrant. We saw it here. I, we, on average, are used to people getting about eight to 10 varieties or eight to 10 um, flowers when they pick. Here, they were leaving with arm loads. And I think it's because we really <laughs> changed the varieties that we had to offer to make them more exciting.
So what kind of tulips do we have over here? This is double flaming parrot. It's an, uh, a parrot tulip. They are, uh, you were, we were talking about the paintings yeah. you see of the artist in Holland. They often have uh, something like this. Yeah. Uh, it, it looks also almost like a painting. They are very, very They're incredible. Unique. Yeah, and they call them parrots because they have the ruffled edges like feathers. And then the colors are usually very striking, especially in this one. This is one of the ones where people see it and they just can't even believe it's a tulip. Yeah. Yeah. And some tulips do smell really good. When you get them in the store, you're not going to get that. But when you have a field grown tulip, then you find out that they're actually fragrant. Yeah, you can smell it. Yeah. it it's subtle, but yes. and some of them are stronger. I had one on my porch one year. I thought it was my daffodils and it took me several days and I finally realized it was the tulip. I finally stuck my nose in there and I was like, oh my gosh, it's a tulip that's actually, I could smell it coming out of my door, which is really unusual. This is just incredibly beautiful. Yeah. And the other fun thing, and I don't know if you know this, but tulip petals are edible. So each color tastes different. You can try this, start at the bottom where it's a little meatier, sort of like if you were eating an artichoke. Artichoke, yeah. Yeah, and I like to wipe off the pollen. <laughs> and then... <Right> here. <laughs> now, would this be the same type of tulip that they would use in the restaurants when you hear about uh, what they're doing with uh, mm -hmm. serving flowers? Yep, and this one I think is good. It's very sweet. I think red colors and orange colors tend to be a little sweeter. Whites and purples, you kind of get this aftertaste of like a pepperiness. But yeah, back in Virginia, we were actually selling some petals to some local DC restaurants. And it also looks really good. It's delicious. <laughs> Isn't it? It's a, everyone's like, what does it taste like? Delicious. It's sort of like um, surprising. Very good. <laughs> you always know it's good because people, I've, I did a test, taste test with children and they were like, this tastes like candy. I had this yeah. red one and it was amazing. So, but you could put this on a salad, um, which looks beautiful. You just do a regular green salad and then you throw these on top and it's amazing. So, but who knew? Tulip petals. Well, because they use, don't they use violets also? In, uh... Yeah, there are a lot of nasturtiums, violets, um, tulip petals. So, yeah, it's... Very good. <laughs>